Hello and welcome to River Dialogues. Like stories, rivers connect us. And dear river people, a very good afternoon. Anyone who joins this program as an audience or as a participant, I call them river people. You know, the last time we met uh, in River Dialogues, we met in person. Seems really so long ago. Hope we can heal. The river, as they say, knows it all. Now, the idea of River Dialogues um, actually emerged from a festival that we do at the India International Center called Art East. And in 2018, the theme of that festival was actually river. And the particular river that we narrated through films, art, history, and discussions was the Brahmaputra. It was a Sangpo, Siang, Brahmaputra, Jamuna, Padda, Meghna. Six rivers that have been flowing forever, almost literally. Now, one of our questions uh, during the festival was that how uh, the Brahmaputra or the Sangpo actually challenges the idea of mainstream or challenges the idea of Ganga if Ganga is mainstream. So if Ganga is a metaphor for India, then Brahmaputra is a metaphor that challenges the Ganga. Now, while we were discussing that, there were people who raised their hand and then they said, well, Brahmaputra or Ganga, neither of them are, are, is my river. My river is the Siyan. Someone said my river is the Adiyar. Someone said my river was Sahibi, a river, dead river that, uh, you know, flowed through Delhi once upon a time. And we realized that people are connected to river, to their own rivers. That is their Ganga. That is their Brahmaputra. So it's, so while we were trying to, you know, pit Brahmaputra against the Ganga, it wasn't really serving the purpose. And we, and that is how we thought that we will start a series of conversations around river and rivers and water. And that brought a really rich variety of ideas from music, poetry, conservation, ecology, gender, displacement, and caste. Uh, river, and one of the participants I quote, says a river is not just a channel carrying water. It's not just hydropower. It's not just irrigation. It's not just drinking water. It's so much more. It's about communities. It's about forests. It's about wetlands, mountains, river mounds, and also deserts at times. And all of these manifestations of the external ecology of the river, but also the internal ecology. Today, we will hear our panelists talk of travel and the river. That's the title of today's uh, discussion. All of them are travelers, and all of them are writers, and all of them have crossed rivers or have walked down rivers. Pallavi Ayer is a foreign correspondent and author. She was reported from across. China, Europe, Indonesia, Japan, and is currently the associate editor of the online magazine, The Globalist, located. She's joining us from actually Madrid, Spain. Uh, I haven't known um, another journalist uh, who has traveled so much, lived in so many places. Uh, it's, it's almost envious, the kind of range that she has had in her coverage. Her most recent books, and I'm saying recent books because she's got a whole list of books, are Jakarta Trails, The Continuing Adventures of Soya Bean and Tofu. I don't like either soya bean or tofu. And A Thousand Cranes for India, Reclaiming Plurality Amid Hatred, where I see at least two of my friends uh, in that anthology. There are several other titles that she has authored. She's also my former colleague at NDTV, which she almost forgot till I reminded her. Victor Mallet. Another foreign correspondent is an author, journalist, commentator who has traveled and worked for more than three decades in Asia, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Again, he must have crossed many rivers. But uh, his uh, definitive book is uh, about Ganges, River of Life, River of Death, the Ganges of modern India. Uh, very well received book. Uh, thanks, Victor, for writing that. I have uh, actually um, studied that book while we, when we were doing this exhibition. One of the trivias that he won, it's not a trivia, but a trivia for uh, in today's India, he won the Ramnath Goenka Award twice, but first for a 2012 feature about the rise of Narendra Modi. So you may be curious, uh, and I'll see if, if we can uh, connect that today in today's uh, lecture somehow to the river. Samrat X Chaudhary, uh, we are still trying to figure out where why he uses X, uh, is a journalist and author, an old friend, he has edited daily broadsheet newspapers in Mumbai, Delhi, Bengaluru, Chandigarh. Um, now he's the co-editor of Insider, Outsider, Belonging and Unbelonging in Northeast India. Uh, his first novel, uh, because that time he said that he was too busy with his broadsheet, so he couldn't 
have traveled to write a nonfiction was actually on Kipling's classic. Uh, and, uh, but his latest book, The Braided River, A Journey Along the Brahmaputra. This is uh, published by HarperCollins. Uh, congratulations, Samrat. And I am your chair today uh, and co-conspirator of River Dialogues along with Tete, uh, who you cannot see, thanks to India International Center and OP General Global University, where I teach journalism after having crossed several rivers and bridges, hopefully burning some of them on my way. Um, I will start with you, Samrat. In the preface to your book, I learned that you have given up a job for walking down a river. Now, has it been worth it? Definitely. Uh, I didn't, I mean, it, it wasn't all walking. We used various means of transport. Uh, some of it was on the river by boat. Some of it was along the river by different, you know, modes of transport, local transport, whatever was available. Sometimes it was cabs. So we used all kinds of transport. Uh, on some, in some cases, we did have to walk, but relatively short distances, I would say. Uh, I think it was worth it because actually, uh, just the journey itself was wonderful, and uh, uh, researching the book taught me a lot. The river itself taught me a lot, you know, about ways ways of seeing, basically. Interesting that you say ways of seeing. I mean, taking off from. John Berger's book, and uh, uh, what did you see? I mean, what other sights and sounds beyond water? I mean, you know, I've always felt that when we look at a river, when we talk about rivers, we are land people. Um, we are not river people. I mean, though I'm addressing everyone as river people, because I wish we all, all become river people to be able to understand the water. Uh, what are the sights and sound, and what did you learn from that? But I'm also, I'm still curious, and I'm, I haven't gotten the answer to my first question. I mean, you you literally threw up a job, and you said, all right, I'm going to walk down the Brahmaputra. Uh, the calling must have been really strong. Uh, what was that calling? What drew you to that place, apart from the fact that, OK, it's a lot, big river, very interesting, incredible journey, but really, at the core of it, what? It could be something very simple, but what is that? What was that calling? No, no, it, it, in my case, it wasn't like that. Uh, it's basically that I, I sort of got into writing the book quite by chance. And once I got into it, I got very involved with it. The more I got into uh, sort of uh, traveling along the river and discovering things about it is when I grew attached to it. So it was not a calling that, that set me off. It was actually chance that set me off. A chance encounter in a conference which led to a you know, a conversation about writing a book. And uh, uh, once I got started is when I actually got very interested in, in, the, uh, in the river itself and in rivers in general. I mean, it didn't happen that I had a calling and went. It, it was more that I fell into it. I mean, since you, you're someone who's uh, published this, this is a, the latest book on the Brahmaputra really to have come out. Can you take us? Is there? Uh, can you take us down the river uh, briefly? I mean, it's a very, very long river, so it's going to be impossible. It takes days and months to go down the river. But uh, will you be able to give us some pictures and take us down uh, this river to show people who haven't seen this river? Uh, yeah, because it's it's a river really worth taking. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I have. I have photos. We have lots of photos, and in fact, uh, if we could see some of those photos right now, that might help. So, so basically, I'll just do a brief geography of the route. So uh, basically, the river starts life as the Sampo in Tibet, and then it flows into Arunachal, where the name changes to Siang. And uh, in some places, it's also called the Dihang. And then it flows into the plains of Assam, where it meets the two other major tributaries, the Dibang and the Lohit, and it becomes the Brahmaputra. Then that flows through Assam and curves around the Garo Hills, goes into Bangladesh, where the name changes to Jamuna. And then eventually, at some point, it meets the Ganga, and the two of them together flow towards the Bay of Bengal. That's the brief geography. This is the Siang. This is how the Siang looks in Arunachal. Next, that's the Lohit. And that's also in Arunachal. Next, that's the Dibang. 
So these are the three formative tributaries. And the Dibang looks really nice and quiet over here, but in the monsoon, it's quite different. Next, that's the Brahmaputra. This is in a, a place near Dibru Saikwa National Park, which is in Upper Assam. Next, this is what the road looks like when you're going up. Uh, this is a section of the road along the Siang going up towards the India-China border. And as you can see, the road is not very good. And uh, that L sign there uh, did not make me very happy when I was uh, you know, <laughs> going up there. Next, uh, that's, that's a part of the, you know, what it looks like on the side of the road. So that's just a shot from the, uh, on the way. The, these photos, by the way, are by my friend Akshay Mahajan, very good photographer who uh, I traveled with. So the two of us went up there together. Next. Uh, this is in, uh, this is the Brahmaputra in, also in Upper Assam. This is at a river island. So the river is dotted with river islands. And of course, it's a vast river. You can't really see the, uh, the other bank. It looks like a line on the horizon. And this is from the middle of the river. This is actually not from a bank because this is a river island. Next. Uh, this is uh, rescued rhino babies at Kaziranga. This photo is by a different photographer, Shubhamoy. Next. And this is the Jomuna. This is the Jomuna bridge near Sirajganj in Bangladesh. So this is a picture that I took. I think that's about it. Uh, that's just a glimpse of the river. Just a few of the yeah. photos we took on the way. Yes, uh, I, I mean, the Brahmaputra, you know, through uh, 10 pictures becomes very difficult to explain, but um, the vastness of the Brahmaputra in, at various points is it's almost as big as the sea. I mean, you can't see the other side of the Brahmaputra, and that's that's important for uh, you know, for people to people who haven't seen the Brahmaputra across the Brahmaputra, it you know it 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 emerges, it, it sources in Tibet and comes down, and as it enters what is today India, there is a Sangpo Gorge, and for at least one and a half, I mean, you know, more than a century, uh, the Scottish Geographical Society, which was obsessed those days in trying to find out the source of rivers. Uh, spent a lot of money and energy sending explorers to find out about the Sangpo Gorge because uh, no one would believe that actually the Sangpo is the Siang and the Brahmaputra. They thought that the Sangpo in its, uh, would actually flow a different direction. If Sangpo had to enter into Siang, then it would fall at a tremendous height, which would probably make it the most incredible sight in the world. It was only actually in 1997 that uh, Ian Baker um, made it into the gorge. Uh, we were lucky that Ian Baker uh, came and made a presentation when we did the festival on the Brahmaputra. Um, it took him years, uh, really. It took him um, almost a decade to be able to go into the gorge and prove finally that, uh, I mean, by then, of course, there was already proof that the Sangpo was the Siang and the Brahmaputra. So the, 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 the story around the Brahmaputra and the Siang is, I mean, no, it's, it's actually, uh, so varied and so old and so incredible that you know one can go on and on. But uh, I will uh, ask Pallavi, uh, who has spent a considerable amount of time in China, and um, since the river comes from there, uh, to ask Pallavi that uh, have you seen um, the river in China? But the bigger question that I wanted to ask, something that Victor uh, reminded that. You know, in India, Victor said that India is very lucky that people are still connected to their rivers. Uh, they still remember rivers uh, through the folklore and the mythology. Uh, in many parts of the world, that's gone. How is it in China, Pallavi? I mean, uh, do people, are people connected to their rivers? 
super interesting question, Kishan. And I'd like to also just quickly say thank you to the IIC and everyone for organizing this. And also to uh, mention that I'm really here in many ways as a sort of supporting cast for Samrat and Victor, who are the true riverists with their books on the rivers. However, I have crossed many rivers uh, in my travels, both metaphorically and uh, literally. And uh, China, of course, was somewhere that rivers was extremely important to. Um, as in India with the Ganga and the Brahmaputra, which of course have many of their sources in, in Tibet, which is now in China. For millennia, China's great rivers have kind of snaked across the country and they provided the lifeblood for the civilization. I mean, in many ways, the Yangtze River in the south and the Yellow River in the north, they're really kind of almost synonymous with um, Chinese culture. But the river in China is hugely interesting, I think, in understanding its history and in some ways also the development of its more contemporary politics. Um, you know, civilizationally, I think the two sort of foundations, of philosophical or metaphysical foundational cornerstones of Chinese culture were Taoism and Confucianism. And I think it's very interesting how the river kind of played in very differently into these two um, uh, thought systems. Uh, when you looked at Taoism, I guess uh, Taoism was most epitomized by the writings of, of Lao Tzu and you know Tao Te Ching that we are mostly familiar with. And water is one of the most important symbols of the Tao or the way. Um, and you know you have tons of wonderful quotes uh, from uh, Lao Tzu uh, about water, uh, like he who lives the Tao acts in his life and dealings as water acts in nature. For water does not resist, yet it conquers all. It is tasteless, suggesting the invisibility of the Tao, yet it is life-giving. Be as water, you know, be supple, flexible, humble. Water does not compete. So you have this concept of water, which also sort of hints at how important rivers and water bodies are to Chinese culture on the one hand. And then you have the more Confucian um, concept uh, which I think was embodied more by China's contemporary politics, Communist Party and Chairman Mao, for example, which was much more anthrocentric, really putting man at the center of nature and uh, you're seeing rivers as something to be conquered by human beings, as something to be tamed and put to the service of humanity. And it was very interesting because uh, Mao, you know, politically he used his swimming skills to demonstrate his virility and his sense of being in control uh, often. Uh, so similar to another gentleman who talks about his 58 inch chest, uh, Chairman Mao um, swam the Yangtze in the 1960s um, as a way of sort of unleashing the, the cultural revolution by proving that he was still virile and that, you know, uh, rumors of his ill health were, were, were overblown. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's very interesting, I think, how water has really figured uh, in literature and also in politics um, and, of course, has been the actual foundation for so much of um, Chinese um, civilization. Uh, we have seen uh, a disconnect um, between uh, people's ways of life and um, nature in general in China, uh, which I think is something that is not only uh, um, peculiar to China, it's something we've seen across the world. Um, and, you know, if I sort of look back at the stories that I did um, that had any sort of direct bearing on the river when I lived in China, they were almost always to do with uh, pollution and with damming. Uh, I remember doing a story in uh, Tiger Leaping Gorge um, and about the areas along it that were going to be flooded as a result of uh, some of the Three, Gorge, uh, the Three Gorges project. Um, and, uh, of course, the fact that a huge amount of river water in China had become polluted up to, um, uh, you know, 20, 30 percent of the great rivers were just nothing but sewage. And um, there had also been a lot of um, um, contamination that was had health effects as a result. So a lot of the stories I did had to do with uh, the brutal health effects, including a sharp increase in liver cancer uh, amongst uh, a lot of the areas that lived up and downstream uh, many of these rivers so that we had a situation in which waters that had once been life-giving had completely transformed into something um, that was toxic. Pallavi, the, uh, the rivers that you have crossed or have seen in your travels, I mean, this is uh, we are talking about of travel and river. How, 
how do you would you be able to compare rivers between the east and the west you've seen rivers on both sides i mean out here as you say about china and uh, particularly in india rivers are like a pilgrimage i mean you know rivers are spiritual uh, it, it's it's uh, uh, it's part so of our identity of aspect that i think the, what really strikes one in india especially is how important it is to religious rituals right and to hinduism and the rites and the ghats of varanasi haridwar rishikesh um, i mean as a as a child in school in india i remember one of the big plays dance dramas we had done was the ganga and we actually showed um, its flow right from um, uh, its source all the way down um uh you know when it mingles with the brahmaputra and so on and you don't really get that in say you know rivers in europe the sort of spiritual significance of it seems to have uh, uh gone um and then a lot of the other places that i've lived in i mean the other two uh, countries that i've lived in indonesia and japan are different again because they are really archipelagos and therefore more sort of oriented towards the sea rather than the river and i think the sea would probably have been more formative as a result when you sort of looking at them culturally although you know of course it's all water ultimately and the rivers do flow into the sea but i think what's very unique about the rivers of say india and china really is also just their expanse and their power um and how very obviously um they have spawned and given life and that you do see that connectivity to the present whereas in europe some of that uh, some of those organic links have been broken and you know it's kind of become much more tidied up and pretty uh, when you sort of walk through this the great cities of europe which you know the, the rhine in germany is very important you have the seine in paris and so on but you know, they kind of become more sort of pretty fine uh, and i think some of that sort of very elemental feeling of rivers that you get in india and china has gone thanks pallavi uh, let me ask victor now since he's uh, he must have grown up in places with um, rivers but that he comes to a country almost uh, adopts uh, or is adopted by i mean he spent a considerable time in india and you know his his reports in india has been uh, we still remember them uh and you and you write a book on ganga um was did ganga really take you up uh like you were in awe of ganga or uh, was there any other reason that you wrote about ganga and how would you compare how would you compare ganga or indian rivers to the rivers where you grew up and i'm not very sure where you grew up victor well it's, it's it's all very good questions i i want to take you up on something you said right at the beginning you said you know we're not really river people uh anymore or we're not you know we're not particularly river people but i think that's wrong i think everybody in the world actually is a river person we are river people uh it's just that we don't know it uh, and it's not just you know bangladesh and 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 west bengal which are obviously kind of very much river countries um it's 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 more it's, it's much bigger than that um uh you know i i challenge you to think of uh, a single major city in the world that isn't founded on a river isn't built on a river i mean i'm in paris now which is on the seine uh, uh the thames in london is is another obvious example the only city i can think of is johannesburg which was built where it was because gold was found there and it became a sort of gold mining center but almost every other major city in the world is is built on a river so we really are kind of all river people and if you look at the ganges um uh, uh you know the ganges catchment area and the brahmaputra catchment area which obviously go together to, they they support you know i mean a, mi- a billion people a seventh of the world's population basically depend on these on these two rivers um and and it's true that we have sort of lost our uh, well in, in the west certainly and, and elsewhere even you know in delhi we 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 are beginning to lose our connection uh to those rivers uh you know which since the dawn of civilization i mean they are actually connected with civilization you know they are the providers of fish food irrigation trade Uh, all those things on which uh, you know tra- travel up and down all those things on which on which civilizations depend on which they they kind of arise from and those things we are beginning to forget you know the delhi and the yamuna are not really as connected as they were and that's partly because of the pollution problems that people have mentioned so uh, and partly because you know the, the city sort of goes on apparently without the river but of course is still utterly dependent on um on the water supply that comes from the the higher reaches of the yamuna and and indeed the ganga for the city so you know we, we it's all very much um part of the uh part of our lives that we just 
we we've kind of lost that connection in the West. And and I think as Pallavi was saying, the religious uh, the religious connection in India, India means that that is less true in India. India is much more connected on a daily basis to its rivers uh, and and especially the Ganga. And and you also um you also sort of asked uh, I think right at the beginning um, uh, Kishalai about um, about the whole sort of you know why is the Ganga kind of the river and and people don't talk so much about the Brahmaputra and I think it, it's really a, a kind of um, uh, it's a it's a matter of 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 eons of, of change you know originally it was the indus river which after all gave its name to india um that was the kind of center of of, of the religious center and and the the civilizational center and that sort of slowly moved east and south uh, uh across the ganga uh and and the ganga is is not it's not so much a sort of it's not just a geographic thing as, as a river it's also it's kind of ever present i mean uh you know when modi went to mauritius he he uh, i think he put ganga water in a in a lake that's called ganga i i was in sri lanka and there's a pond near a temple that is named after ganga there's even a well in uh, in the cotswolds in in southern england uh which is connected to the ganga because a maharaja a grateful maharaja uh, built a well for the water short people of this village in the cotswolds so you know it is a kind of uh ever-present thing uh, as, as a kind of spiritual and a, uh, yeah, I mean, essentially a spiritual presence, even if the actual water is not necessarily from the Ganga itself. So, you know, we are all sort of connected. And just you asked, um, you know, about my connection. I mean, yeah, I, I just kind of have always been obsessed with rivers. You know, I was I was brought up, by, I guess, in um, a lot of it abroad, but in in Kent, where there's a little river, sort of a mile from where I live, which you know you can walk along, and and I I did it the other day when I was writing my book about the Ganga and discovered that it's actually quite long. It's a hundred kilometers long. It's a tiny river, uh, but you know down that river as well there was trade uh, up until the 1950s. There was coal being transported along this what is now a very small river, uh, uh, and and so on. So you know these things do kind of uh, live on. And then I as as a child I was also I lived in Sudan. Um, in Khartoum, which is at the confluence of the Blue Nile and the White Nile, which makes the Nile. And, and just uh, to go back, one of the things I mentioned um, is, uh, you know, the cities are built on rivers. They're also often built on river confluences. And as you know, in Hinduism, river confluences, uh, like the one at Allahabad, uh, are very holy and are very important. And the same is true, uh, was true in the West. You know, the, the confluences of rivers in uh, ancient Britain were very important religiously and people used to make offerings as they still do in India today to the river. It's just that nowadays that has kind of fallen by the wayside. But but in, in, in ancient history, it's still the case that those rivers were uh, were very important religiously. But I better stop there because you probably have a, a, another question. Uh, you, um, you know, you argue in your book, uh, you know, that uh, the Ganga is the most important uh, river in the world for the sheer number of uh, people it supports and for its cultural and historical significance and therefore perhaps it becomes a symbol in that sense and yeah uh, but yeah, <laughs> it is, it is, yeah, yeah is there a is there a danger of uh, mainstreaming rivers and people uh, I mean which is which is something that you 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 already mentioned but I'm uh, repeating the question that you know that uh, we don't I mean Narmada is in, in our collective consciousness because of the protests around Narmada. Uh, but, uh, you know, no one talks of the Adiyar in uh, Chennai, which is, uh, which flows through uh, Chennai and now in a terrible shape and state. Uh, no one talks about the Krishna and the Godavari uh, in the up north. Or, uh, so uh, is there, I'm, I'm, I'm again posing the question to you for a, for a, for a, more clearer uh, answer prompting you to say that i mean is there a danger i, I, I think what you're what you're asking if i get you right what you're asking is sort of do by focusing only on major rivers important rivers that in the public consciousness we tend to forget the others i think yes. that is possibly true but i think that there's a sort of there's a more optimistic way of looking at that which is to say that uh if we can uh, deal with the problems in an iconic river it also means we can deal with the problems in uh, lesser known rivers and and and, and the, the contrary is also true you know I, one of the things i the conclusion of my book is really about how uh india has not yet lost uh the ganga to uh pollution and disaster and overdevelopment uh, as some other countries have done but it also makes the point that uh 
other countries or other parts of the world have begun to recognize the importance of their rivers again. And they have, in a sense, restored those rivers to health. Uh, and this is very much the case in London, which, you know, even when I was a child, the Thames was essentially a dead river at London, in London. Uh, it's slightly different from the Ganga at, at Benares, for example, because it's a it's a it's a obviously a much smaller river, but it's also a tidal river in London. But the point is that the river was so polluted over so many years that it essentially became dead. There were no fish; it was toxic, and they always said if you fell in the river, you know, you'd have to have your stomach pumped because it was so dangerous. I mean, that was just not that long ago when I was a child, um, and now the river has been restored to health. And you may not notice it when you go because it's a muddy river because it's it's got lots of silt, but it's actually quite clean and there are fish in it and you even get sort of whales and dolphins uh, wandering by mistake up the river. It's really a, a clean river. The same is true of the Rhine in, in Europe, which uh, which runs through six or seven countries, which uh, is a hugely important river civilizationally and for trade in Europe. And this too was quite polluted until a few decades ago. And again, a lot of money was spent on restoring it. And, uh, and, and that you know, example spreads across to other rivers. And in the United States, you've had similar issues where, in fact, when um, Obama uh, first met Modi a few years back, they actually talked about, uh, you know, where I was told by one of the people who was in the meeting, they actually talked about the environment and they talked about rivers. Uh, and Obama told him how the Chicago River had once been so toxic that it used to catch fire and you couldn't eat the fish, you know, and now you can catch fish and, and eat the fish and so on. Uh, and and uh, Modi actually said, that's exactly what I want for the Ganga. And, you know, we can argue about whether or not he has actually succeeded in doing anything to, to rescue the Ganga from pollution. But he certainly talked about it. And he certainly initially in, uh, and in his first administration, he certainly had the will to do that. So, yeah, I think it's, you know, the main thing is that the rivers should be should be uh, not preserved in aspect, but should be allowed to run. Uh, 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 as, as Samrat was saying, you know, what, one of the things, and, and you were saying, it, it, it's not so much that you need to control the river. Uh, actually, rivers, especially in, in North India and India, they tend to wander around the place, you know, and they should be allowed to wander around the place because in doing so, although they can be destructive, they also deposit life-giving silt, which gives fertility to the crops. And as soon as you start channeling the rivers too much, you lose that. And obviously that's happening in the Nile, for example, as well, where the, the life-giving silt is no longer available as it was uh, to the sides of the river uh, because of, of, of big dams that are being and have been built on the Nile. So you have, uh, you know, it's kind of important to preserve rivers, uh, but not to try to control them too much, because then you lose some of the benefits that rivers have always given to, to mankind. Well, one last uh, thing in this co conversation, Victor, is that you've been referring referring to the river as Ganga, but your book uh, calls it the Ganges. Um, was it the publisher's call or your call? Uh, it, it was it was my call. I mean, I had a. Um, I know you know uh, some Indians get very upset if you call it the Ganges instead of Ganga, but obviously the audience is international. So in, in the book itself, I, I refer to it as both, depending on, you know, what I'm talking about. Uh, the title, though, does have the word Ganges in it because it is for an international audience. And most people outside India don't know what, what Ganga is. But I personally, I don't think this is really very controversial, you know, in the same way that uh, you can argue about whether it's Bombay or Mumbai or Chennai or Madras. You know, in, in reality, these things are not hugely significant because, uh, you know, I mean, I live in, in France uh, and the French call London... Londres. Well, that, you know, we call it London and they call it Londres, but we don't get upset about that. They call England Angleterre. Uh, they call Great Britain Grand Bretagne. I mean, that is just the French for um, the French for London and England and Britain. Uh, and in the same way, Ganges is the English for Ganga, you know. So in, in that sense, I don't I don't feel it's controversial. Although I know it, it can be quite a sensitive issue in India. Uh, so I, I actually in, in, in the book, I indiscriminately use both and if I'm quoting people and they say Ganga, I obviously use Ganga. And I have a little note at the beginning of the book explaining what I've done and just saying, actually, it's not a big deal. You know, this is just uh, not not controversial. But I, I don't know if you will agree, but that's, you know. Yeah, no, I'm not offended at all. I, yeah, I just yeah. wanted to know, you know, what made you take the call? I know that it's for the international audience. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Pallavi, are, uh, in, in China, is there a thing about names of uh, rivers? Uh, as in, are they very rigid about the way you pronounce it and uh, uh, refer to the name? No, no, the Chinese are quite, 
the child is very flexible about uh, these kinds of things. Um, it's just the Yangtze and it's a Huanghe, but in English it's called the Yellow River, right? Um, uh, most people don't know how to say uh, and so on. So yeah, I don't think that they're that bothered. And the Chinese, in fact, tend to make Chinese names for all foreign uh, names as well because the language is such that it cannot absorb uh, foreign phonetics very easily. And so it's like a two-way street and they're quite comfortable with having dual sets of uh, names for things. Um, so, you know, just as, uh, you know, like McDonald's in, in China would be my Dan Lao. It wouldn't be McDonald's. But similarly, many Chinese people adopt English names when they are talking to an international audience. And so you'll have, you know, Yang Yu or whatever, introducing themselves as Lucy or Elizabeth. So I think when it comes to names and politics, uh, it's not quite the same as it is in, um, in, in India. Also, Pallavi, um, you know, uh, in, in China, I mean, uh, Tibet or China, uh, is probably the source of you know more than ten rivers that go you know into, into Asia, South Asia. Uh, I'm sure China is uh, conscious of uh, being an upper riparian and how uh, rivers are political. But is that something that is um, the, a common Chinese would uh, also re talk about or understand, realize the politics of rivers? No, I don't think I don't think that the sort of politics of um, rivers is something that's very um, uh, high up in the public consciousness. And that's partly because, you know, it's a controlled press and so there are certain things that end up getting written about. But interestingly, like what I was talking about earlier, um, the, the, the pollution, the, the pollution of rivers and the growth of these so-called cancer villages and so on, that did take on a life of its own and was an example in many ways of civil society pushing um, the CCP towards uh, environmental reform. Um, and there was a kind of uh, 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 space that had opened up, particularly in the early 2000s, uh, for journalists to be able to talk about um, the environment quite openly. And a lot of that did focus on water pollution and led to real change. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, water is such an important uh, resource and the fact that China controls um, so many of um, the rivers that flow into India and also Southeast Asia is certainly uh, something that makes uh, the river very political. And, um, you know, uh, it can, uh, rivers can become uh, geopolitical tools for coercive diplomacy um, quite easily. And, you know, I think that there are many predictions that say that, like, the, the, the big conflicts of the future will really be over water and rivers rather than oil, uh, which is something that uh, for, for many years people were more focused on as flashpoints. Uh, Samrat, uh, something that Victor invoked, and, you know, uh, that was the first um, reference of river, actually, when I started studying rivers, uh, that, you know, rivers are or were are the ancient highways. I mean, we didn't have roads, we actually had rivers. Um, Brahmaputra, the river that you um, uh, traveled uh, and wrote about was uh, a very important uh, highway or rather a waterway, um, even uh, till very recently. I mean, you know, when I'm saying recently, it would be about 100 years back because the tea that went out from Assam uh, down the river um, and all the way to the ports and then to Europe, uh, was a substantial part of uh, Britain's uh, GDP, which is, of course, uh, not the same as IMT. As, so, so is that something that you cover in your book of uh, Brahmaputra and rivers as ancient highways? Yes, it's there. And uh, I think uh, what I'll do is I'll just, instead of talking about it, I'll just quickly read a little bit so that, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I, I think that will get to the nub of, uh, of the river as highway thing. Yes, and if so you if if, is, if it if, if if it goes too long because we have a time constraint, then I will interrupt you. So yeah, Allah, that's fine. Allah, okay, thanks. That's fine. Yeah, please, please read. So this is from a chapter called Vapor and Vigor, uh, and it's about uh, look the advent of steamer travel. Travel on the river, especially before the advent of steamers, was an experience so distant from ours as to be unimaginable. Writing in the closing years of the 1800s, Alfred Brain, historian of the Indian General Steam Navigation Company Limited, which ran steamer services from Calcutta to Dibrugarh and Allahabad, wrote, 
the India of the early years of the present century, he was writing in the 1800s, so this is the 1800s, is so far removed from the India of today as to make one marvel how our predecessors of but a generation or two back managed to make life worth living. The Ganges, wrote Brain, was then the great highway from Calcutta into the interior. For although the Grand Trunk Road was in existence, it was used in cases of great emergency only and involved the utmost discomfort. The civilian, the soldier, the planter and trader all journeyed to Patna, Allahabad or Delhi by water, in pinnaces, baudias or bajaros according to their means and station in life. So these were all different kinds of wooden boats and they were all powered by oars and sails and basically they differed from one another uh, in size. Uh, the bajaro was the big boat and it had a cabin and a roof. So it was used by the richer people. Uh, and the boats were generally tracked up the river along the banks by ropes, unless the wind was favorable, when sail was set and the weary crew had a welcome rest. That's brain writing. Now, the interesting thing is that you look at the scale of time and, and, and you know the way the government set it up. So the government servants had a fixed allowance to hire boats. And when they were moved from one station to another station, they also got a, 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 an amount of time in which they were supposed to cover their distance. And this will give you a sense of the scale of time for boat journeys before the steamer. It is Calcutta to Munger, one month, eight days. Calcutta to Baksar, two months. Calcutta to Allahabad, three months. Calcutta to Dhaka, one month. And he says, such faraway places as Assam or Sillet were beyond the range of any fixed time. So basically, if you were traveling from Calcutta to Assam or Sillet in the early 1800s, then you sort of you set off and you hoped that you know, someday ultimately you're going to reach. And we get an exact sense of you know, how long that might take from there are accounts. So there's an account by the American Baptists who moved from Calcutta to Saudia, right at the end of Upper Assam. And uh, this journey took them from December 1835 to March 1836. So four months to go that distance. And then the steamers came. And that just changed everything. So Brehm wrote that it was only in 1828 that it took three months to make a journey that is now traversed in 18 hours. And the now that he's talking about is 1899. And the route he's talking about, the journey which took three months in 1828 was Calcutta to Allahabad. And by 1899, it's already become 18 hours. So basically, it it had taken 70 years and the industrial revolution for the distance between these hitherto remote lands to shrink to practically nothing. So, I mean, in the context of the Brahmaputra also, it's basically, it's, it's the advent of steamer travel and the combination of steamer travel with tea plantations, uh, which sort of integrated that part of the, of the world. First, the Brahmaputra Valley and subsequently the hills into what is now mainland India or what is now India. First, it was the British Indian Empire. And then so, so the northeast of India came into India only because of river travel. And India's frontiers on the Chinese side were also shaped by it because the disputed frontier between India and China, the McMahon line, it comes out of a, a river journey or a journey along a river. It's a journey uh, in 1900 and I think uh, it was 12, 13, the winter, when uh, there was an expedition uh, which went along the Dibang, the valley of the Dibang, all the way into Tibet. And uh, it I, was will, the I, will, I, I will, I will, I will ask you to hold your thoughts out here, um, Samrat, because there is a question uh, about okay. regarding that, and I think we've uh, we are close. I mean, I mean, the audience has been asking a lot of questions, so I think I'll. We'll move to that and uh, let you continue with the thought that you were sharing. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, if some of you have joined later and were wondering what Samrat is reading out from, that's from Samrat's latest book, The Braided River. Um, he could explain to us in one of his answers what braided means. Uh, uh, this is also one of those only last rivers in the world which has not been touched by uh, mankind, which means it's not been dredged or anything of that sort. So it's a natural river, um, something that Samrat will be able to explain. But, you know, in each of your responses, when you respond to other people, I want each of you to also say that 
travel writing, uh, which is, I mean, what we are talking about, our travel and river, is also involves tremendous amount of research because, you know, this book that I was going through, I haven't yet completed reading the book. Um, but there is, just now what he narrated, it, this, this involves a lot of research. So it's not like, you know, you just go down the river and say, oh, I love the river. And this is not a travelogue, really, or even a travelogue needs research. I think that is something important that we forget talking about when we discuss uh, about rivers and writing. So I'll quickly start with the questions, uh, Samrat, and since you were mentioning about it, there's someone called Samaresh Chatterjee um, from Delhi. And a question that he has for you is that, how close to the Tibet border uh, did you go during your travels? So you could complete well, I, what you were saying and you know, also answer the question. Uh, well, I got all the way right up to the uh, up to the McMahon line, more or less, where the last the last village, uh, which is Gelling, and uh, in this up the Siang Valley, and uh, we were stopped on the outskirts of Gelling by the Indian Army, who happened that day to be having some uh, sort of uh, gathering out there, and uh, the commanding officer was visiting, and the uh, Jawans were a bit agitated, so we basically got uh, sort of. Uh, made to stand in a corner kind of thing next to you know, the edge of the road with the river far below. And uh, then we were put on the back of a dumper truck and sent back. So okay. that, there is a, another <laughs> question from Mithul Barua from Noida, who says, I think the fact that people are deeply connected to rivers is not really unique to India. We see it across the world vis-a-vis uh, -vis many iconic rivers. We need to also note how the rivers are actually treated here in India by both the state and people that is polluting it, damming it increasingly, and so on and so forth. It's a comment. But um, Victor, would you like to respond to the comment? Um, because uh, Mithul Barua uh, feels that there is a similar kind of connection uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, no, I completely agree with him. I mean, I, I, I've kind of tried to make the same point. I think the, 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 the sad thing is, in a way, that this connection has been lost over the years. I mean, you might say that it's been regained, you know, for example, in Paris, where there used to be a sort of motorway running along the River Seine. It's been replaced now with uh, with uh, uh, open spaces for people to walk and bicycle and sit and drink, which is actually nice because you've got a reconnection with the river. But it's true that in a lot of countries, and I think in Delhi, as I said, there has been a bit of a loss of that connection. Uh, but hopefully, you know, people will begin to to reconnect. Um, j just one point you wanted uh, you you mentioned about research. Absolutely right. I mean, one of my favorite books uh, about India is Slowly Down the Ganges by Eric Newby, uh, uh, and you know, he was a travel writer, a very famous and, and very good travel writer who who notoriously used to take masses of books with him on his travels, which which was quite hard because obviously they're very heavy. But, you know, he always did a lot of historical research when he did his um, when he did his his travels. And, and I think all of us do. You know, it's uh, as you go, you tend to want to see what what was going on and and thinking about the trade down the river and up the Brahma Proof to the tree, tra the tea trade. Uh, I know the Modi government talked a lot initially about um, uh, reopening, uh, you know, the, the Ganga as a kind of trade route. And it's it's a bit difficult because there are places where it gets very shallow uh, and so on. And a lot of, uh, especially with problems in the Himalayas, uh, quite often uh, barges and ships will run aground, as I've experienced myself in the Hooghly. Um, but nevertheless, the kind of the idea is there of regenerating uh, the Ganga as a trade route as well as a uh, as well as uh, everything else that it, that, it, that it also is. And if you look back, um, uh, you know, through history, I mean, it was really a massive trade route, and we shouldn't forget that. Uh, Ralph Fitch, who was a 16th century ambassador in the time of Shakespeare, who came to meet Akbar, although Akbar couldn't be bothered to see him because Queen Elizabeth I was not a very important world figure if you were Akbar, you know, who, who ruled uh, 50 times as many people as she did, and he wasn't really interested in her. But anyway, Ralph Fitch had this wonderful description uh, at the time, uh, almost a unique description of of traveling down the river. And he, he said he went in the company of traders uh, with 180 vessels going from Agra down to Saptagram, which is uh, a now kind of disused port, I think, in the in the mouth of the, the Ganges in, in Bengal. So, uh, you know, yeah, the, the, the point is that the connections are still there, but they do tend to get slightly um, 
interrupted by other obsessions. You know, people people tend to think about cars rather than boats. And then in a lot of cities, though, we've seen an attempt to sort of revive river transport commercially and river travel for tourism and, and transit. You know, like in London, they keep having these attempts to have high speed boats as, as buses going along the river. So, you know, there, there, are, there is often an attempt to remake that, that connection. Yep. Uh, you know, uh, staying with you, Victor, uh, there was also a question from Asha Gopinathan, but um, and very important political, also probably developmental. But um, what about river linking projects? I mean, that's what they want to know, set up by the government. The Ken Betwa is an example. Yeah, well, that's that was another obviously. that was another uh, massive, ambitious program of the of the first Modi government. I don't know quite what stage it's got to, and I think the Ken Betwa is probably the most advanced uh, part of that. But but my impression at the time, and, and uh, my information is is a year or so out of date, is that actually although there might be one or two river linking projects they are so controversial in india uh, and although democracy has been somewhat undermined uh, in recent years the fact is that unlike in china where the government simply does what it wants uh, in india that's much harder for a government to do because people it's it, it's very densely populated along the rivers and people want to have their say and i think the very ambitious parts of these the sort of giant river linking projects to get water from north to south I don't see that ever happening in India in, in a big way, uh, even if one or two projects go ahead. We're in China, uh, they have started to do that kind of thing already, and um, and they have the money and the muscle and the authoritarian ability to go ahead with that. Although, again, the very most ambitious ones, including taking lots of water out of the Brahmaputra and, and sort of diverting it to northern China, even even Chinese uh, academics don't seem to think that's really likely to happen anytime soon. And uh, Pallavi, um, uh, you know, just like we we are talking about Ganga and the Brahmaputra, we ended up talking about India and China more than other countries. But you've uh, you've uh, worked and lived in Japan. You say that uh, you know uh, water is a symbol in China. What is it in Japan? I mean, how do they uh, treat water or rivers? Well, as I was saying earlier, I mean, it's an archipelago. And so in many ways, the ocean figures more strongly, perhaps, in the imagination uh, of the Japanese than the river. But the river has also been very important because all of nature is actually very important uh, in Japanese aesthetics. And uh, one of my favorite things is um, reading haiku or, you know, sort of these short um, uh, uh, Japanese poems, which are restricted um, in terms of their syllables, syllabically restricted and are very uh, suggestive and evocative. They're kind of like the poetic equivalent of um, ink splash paintings, where you just have a few little squiggles um, on a page, but you know they evoke entire scenes. And um, most haiku have to have something called a kigo, which is a seasonal word or a reference to the season in them, which helps to locate the reader where they are. And often when the river pops up in uh, Japanese haiku um, it is uh, sort of locating you in the summer because that's when you tend to get the most swollen um, rivers and I, uh, I you know sort of just looked up a couple of um, my favorite uh, uh, haiku poets uh, who are probably uh, Basho who's the best known um, uh, Busan who was uh, you know one of the 18th century great masters and also Shiki who was a late 19th century master and I thought I'd quickly read out three these are very short so Busan wrote a summer river being crossed how pleasing with sandals in my hands Shiki wrote and this is a more modern construction Although there is a bridge, my horse goes through the water. This immediately makes you think about how fresh and cool that river water must be, how tempting that the horse will go through the water rather than taking the bridge. And then, of course, possibly the most famous one is by Basho. And in Japanese, it reads, Samidare wo Atsumete Hayashi Mogami Gawa. And it translates as, the rains of summer join together how swift it is, the Mogami River. And it's interesting, again, because it's difficult when you're not rooted in that culture to necessarily appreciate it because they're so short. But the rains of summer immediately 
in Japan would evoke a sense of pathos, of, of beauty being somehow necessarily intertwined with sadness as well, which gives it a very special feeling. But um, I just thought since we're talking about rivers, it would, have, it would be nice to bring up a few haiku as well. Thanks, Pallavi. I think it kind of, you know, the way one thinks about a river in a very poetic way, um, rather than being prosaic, though I don't uh, see any conflict between prose and poetry, uh, I think both uh, occupy the same, you know, they have their own uh, beauty. But I, I you know, it, it's, a, it's a lovely way to uh, uh, end the conversation. Um, I know that Victor will have to leave and we have to wrap up this conversation. There was someone, I'd just like to read out at least one, one, one of the responses from the uh, Deepali from Delhi, who's, who actually says that uh, she she comes from the place where Ganga um, begins or starts. She says, Dev Prayag, where Alak Nanda and Bhagirati converge to make the Ganga. And having seen river and life around it so closely and, and the fact that nature takes its own course, do you really think that the rivers could potentially come and take back their due. Now, uh, in response to that, um, uh, Dipali, I'll just uh, quote from one of the previous uh, participants, and that's what I do in each of the editions. I actually save a little quote from one of the panelists, and I use it in the next edition of River Dialogues. Uh, uh, and in uh, Sumana Roy, one of the writers, uh, good friend, who was in their anthology, Pallavi, um, yeah, so this is Somana's, uh, and she was there in the last, in the previous uh, River Dialogue. It was Somana and Parinita Dandekar, and they were talk, they were talking about uh, poetry, uh, about water and rivers. And uh, she says that in a Nandalal Bose painting called Chorui Bhati, which translates uh, to picnic, you have a canvas that's set on the banks of the river Kopai. You have these trees, and you see the trees because he was a master of painting, motion, and movement. You have the trees swaying in the wind. Just as a dot, you see a man's head. Here is a man who's trying to make us remember uh, that uh, that is what a man is. A man is not at the center of the universe. Man is not the center of the canvas. We have forgotten that. Uh, so whether to art or to other mediums, that's one thing uh, we would like a vocabulary for these relationships to be created. And, I think you know river dialogues and these series of conversation are an attempt to do that. I mean, it's a free flowing conversation. Uh, there, there are no takeaways really, but the takeaway is to say that we are not really the center of the universe. I mean, there are other elements of the of nature, and we are just a part of it. Um, anyone who joins this conversation becomes a river person, but I uh, will stand corrected because Victor says that we are actually all river persons, and I hope you will become. Uh, channel for water and rivers to carry the stories that you just now heard, stories that are inside you, stories that will connect us just like rivers. And uh, something that I would urge uh, the audience and everyone is to please go and pick up the book, um, Victor's, uh, Pallavi's, and Shamrat's. Uh, there is Vic Victor putting up his book, Braided River. Pallavi is not doing that. She says she wants to be a cheerleader. Pallavi, where's your book? Don't you have a book next to you? One of your books? <laughs> I have a bunch of other okay. books. But... Okay. Oh, yeah. Your, your uh, that's, 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 that's two from the book. Yeah. That, that's a Dev Prayag picture, uh, Kishala. You were talking about Dev Prayag just now. Dev Prayag, so, yeah. Not, a, Prague. not a very good uh, picture. I mean, not a very good image from here. But anyway, that's... Uh, I do. I do mention Dev Prague, of course. Yeah, yeah. and like like our friend Sainath says that uh, you know our cost of a book is uh, actually less than uh, taking a friend out for coffee. So uh, you know, please go ahead, go out and buy the book, uh, but also travel down the river. And since all of us can't travel all the rivers across all the rivers, it would be nice to read the book and uh, cross the river uh, through the book. So. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Samrat, uh, Pallavi, IIC. Uh, thanks, Tete. Thanks, Nishant. And um, we will soon uh, let you know about the next edition of River Dialogues uh, coming up. And that's going to be on the Indus. Good day uh, and stay safe. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thanks.